Welcome to The Apple Seed, the storytelling podcast from BYU Radio, where your family can gather for great stories from great storytellers in every episode. And the stories on the show will spark memories and thoughts that you can share with the people you love. We hope you do that. After all, stories bring us together. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and as I think about the stories we'll share with you today... I'm thinking about a saying you've probably heard. The main version of the saying goes, He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Ever heard anybody ever say that? It's a phrase that comes from a passage in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, that part of the Bible where Jesus is being taken by guards in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter, the disciple, takes out his sword to defend Jesus. And Jesus says, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Well, people use that saying as a warning that whatever nefarious trickery you might use to get ahead tends to be the same sort of nefarious trickery that comes back to get you in the end. It's a phrase that has a lot in common with another phrase you may have heard. What goes around comes around. You've heard people say that, right? Now, today's stories are pretty lighthearted, but there's a lot going around and coming around. (laughs) And it starts with this story told by North Carolina storyteller Donald Davis, a story not so much about living by the sword and dying by the sword, but rather living and dying by what Donald calls the cow pile. Here's the story on the apple seed. So it was a Sunday... And we had been to church, of course, because we always went to church on Sunday. But normally on Sunday, before we ever left to go to church, my mother would totally fix our Sunday dinner, and then she would put it in the refrigerator. So when we got home after like, you know, four or five semesters at church, (laughs) she could pull it out and we'd be ready to eat before we starved to death. But we got home that Sunday, I was about eight years old. My little brother Joe was about six years old. And our mother had not fixed our Sunday dinner. And she said, I'm sorry, boys. I just didn't have time to cook before we left today. So I'm going to have to cook before we can eat. No, we're going to starve to death. We're hungry right now. No, it won't be too long, but I've got to cook our Sunday dinners. And boys, I have something good you can do while you wait. I thought, yeah. It's going to be stupid. I don't know what it is, but I already know it's going to be stupid. She said, here's an idea. Why don't you boys go outside and see how many times you can run around the house till I call you? I told you it's going to be stupid, didn't I? Well, we started toward the door to go run around the house. And all of a sudden, our mother said, Where do you think you're going? Wait a minute, what did she tell us to do? Go run around the house, right? We said we're going to run around the house. She said, not in your Sunday clothes. Can you read your mother's mind? How are you supposed to know to not go yet? She said, go take off your nice clothes and put something on for play that you can't hurt. Something you can't hurt. Have played naked, I guess. They never made something you can't hurt, right? But we did. We went in our bedroom, and we took off our nice Sunday clothes. And where we live, kind of out in the country, we put on short pants, we put on T-shirts, and always in the summer, we stayed barefoot. And then we came back in the kitchen, and we started to go out the door and run around the house. Well, we went outside. We ran down through the backyard, right across that fence. That's where the chickens lived. We went around below the house, right across that fence. That's where the cow lived. We went around in the front of the house, right across that fence. That's where the road lived. <laughs> and then we came to the driveway, which was not paved. The driveway was gravel and cinders. And with our bare feet... We couldn't run across that. So we turned around. We went all the way back around the house. We went in the door, and we said to our mother, you're trying to kill us. (laughs) 
She said, what's wrong? We said, we can't run across the driveway, it hurts our feet. And then our daddy said, I got a great idea. Now wait a minute. Do any of you happen to have a dad who when he says, I got a great idea, it's a bad idea. <laughs> he said, don't run around the house. Go outside and climb the fence into the cow pasture. There's no gravel in the cow pasture. There are no cinders in the cow pasture. It's just nice grass. Go out there and climb the fence and run all around and play in the cow pasture, and I'll call you when it's time to come inside for dinner. And the last thing we heard as we went out the door was, watch where you step. <laughs> Well, we got outside and we climbed the fence over into the cow pasture and we started running around and playing. Now, I knew what was on the ground in the cow pasture. You do too, don't you? <laughs> and I was sure not going to step in any of it. You wouldn't either, would you? But all of a sudden, I saw my six-year-old little brother come running past and I saw his clean little, almost pink feet. <laughs> and I got an idea for a science experiment. I said, Joe, 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 what do you think would happen if you were running around in the cow pasture and all of a sudden you just accidentally stepped right in a cow pile? He went, ooh, that's nasty. You would stink till you were dead. And I said, maybe, maybe not. He said, what do you mean maybe not? I said, think about it. It takes a little bit of time for everything that happens to happen. What if you were so fast, and I know you're fast, that you could step in the cow pile and then you could pull your foot out so fast there is not time for anything to get on it. He said, do you think that would work? I said, well, there's only one way to actually find out. Let's try. But wait, did I mean let's try? Or did I mean you try? Well, we picked a nice, beautiful, fresh one. It was nice and kind of slicky, greeny on top. And he got his little foot all ready. And when he was ready, he went, bam, it squirted up between his toes. It was beautiful. And he said, it didn't work. I said, that's only your first try. You almost never get something on your first try. Do it again. He did it again. Bam. It just was splattering up in the air like that. And then I looked at him, and he was getting a little grin on his face. He said, I think I'll try the other foot. And he tried the other foot. And then he would run and jump and land with both feet. And then his feet slid out from under him. And he went sliding across. And when he got up, he was a ruined child. <laughs> About that time, our daddy came to call us to tell us that dinner was ready. You think we went toward the house? Nope. We went around and hid behind the barn. I thought, I don't even need a home. I can live back here. <laughs> but our daddy kept coming. He was calling, Donald, Joe, where are you? Where are you? I was hiding. My little brother was standing right kind of at the corner. I said, Daddy's going to find you. And all of a sudden, our daddy hollered, Boys! And my brother Joe jumped out and went, But I! And our daddy went, whoa, what got hold of you? And my brother told him the whole story, and I was the main character. <laughs> and then my daddy looked to me, and you know what he said? He said, since you're so smart, why don't you show him how to do it? 
And then he led me around the cow pasture, and I had to step in every cow pile, I think 20 times at least. And by that time, our mother had come out of the house to see why we weren't back yet. She took one look at us and told us our clothes had to be burned. And my brother started crying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. She said, no, silly, you take them off first. <laughs> but imagine what we looked like. You think we got to come inside the house to take those clothes off? Nope. We had to take them off in the backyard where cars going down the road could see us. And my daddy started squirting us with the water hose and laughing. And our mom went inside, and then she came back with a big bucket of warm, soapy water and the mop. <laughs> and she started mopping us naked. And she would mop us, and our daddy would spray us off, and she would mop us. And they thought it was so funny, so funny, so funny. They kept doing that so long that by the time we finally went inside, guess what? The food had burned. <laughs> Well, everybody learned something that day. My daddy never again suggested playing barefoot in the cow pasture. My mother never again let us go to church on Sunday unless she had fixed our dinner or we already had a plan to eat somewhere after that. I learned that if I ever have to have another brother, I hope I can get one that can't talk. <laughs> Because if they can't talk, they can't tell on you, right? <laughs> and you know what my little brother learned? He learned that every time I tried to get him to do something, he would do it. <laughs> Smoke one of daddy's cigars. It's good. Okay. Uh, jump out of the barn loft with an umbrella. It's just like a parachute. Okay. <laughs> Open the Christmas presents. You don't have to wait till Christmas. They won't get mad at you. You're the baby. Okay. Row your little cars to the road. See what the big cars do. Okay. I thought he was the dumbest child in the world. And it took me a long time to figure out he was not the dumb one. Because think about it. If he did it, but I had thought it up, Guess which one of us got punished in the end? <laughs> and you might want to remember that. <laughs> also. Donald Davis with a story called Cow Piles here on the Appleseed. Boy, why is it that when you hatch a perfectly good plan to cover your little brother in cow manure, you wind up with manure all over yourself? Well... Maybe there's a lesson there for people with such mischief on their minds. In fact, listening to Donald's story brought a memory to mind for me. In this memory, I'm just a little kid, maybe five years old, and I've just heard the term practical joke for the first time. And, well, I'm interested. My dad will remember maybe walking through the house one day to find on the floor between the hall and the living room a banana peel set out by me, just trying out my practical joke skills, set out for my dad to slip on like a cartoon character. Classic, right? Well, do I have to tell you my dad got out of that one unscathed? But I must say I improved. The practical jokes got a little more crafty. It was the day I offered my mom an Oreo cookie, and I had replaced the cream filling at the center of the Oreo with Crisco shortening, and she fell for it, and oh, the satisfaction! I felt like I was ready to level up. It was time for me to go to the kitchen sink to the sprayer beside the main faucet, you know, the one you pull out on a long hose to spray dishes off, the one you activate by pressing the little handle right on the sprayer. Well, it was time to take a rubber band and rubber band that handle open so, you know, whoever came by, all unsuspecting, and turned on the kitchen faucet would, well, you know, I was so excited to see this go down. 
I carefully snapped the rubber band around the handle and carefully positioned the sprayer so it was pointing right at whoever might be standing at the sink. Well, most of the day went by, and no one had been caught in my practical joke trap, and I kind of forgot about it. And then came the moment when my mom shouted down from upstairs, Hey, Sam, would you mind bringing me up a glass of water? Well, sure, Mom, I shouted without another thought, and I went immediately to the sink, reached out, turned on the water, and, well... You know the soggy rest of the story. He who lives by the practical joke, as it turns out, dies by the practical joke. That's where Donald's story took me. Where did the story take you? And who will you take along? Simultaneously laughing, we're all agreed that we love, love, love the apple seed. There's a lot yet to come on today's episode, but I wanted to take just a moment to introduce you to another one of the shows from among the BYU radio family of podcasts. The show is called Constant Wonder. It's hosted by Marcus Smith. And in every episode of Constant Wonder, Marcus will have a riveting conversation with an individual whose life has been touched by the awe and wonder in nature, human nature or the natural world. It's all phenomenal. Uncover captivating stories that shed light on the wonders of creation. And you'll walk away feeling a little awestruck yourself from just about every episode. It's Constant Wonder with Marcus Smith. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube, uh, all kinds of ways to listen to Constant Wonder whenever you like. Get a little dose of awe. Constant Wonder from BYU Radio. Tell me some more. Okay, I'll proceed with my story inspired by the apple seed. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and it's time for another story. This one told for you by Shauna Lee, who has more than 3,000 stories rolling around in her head, part of the Jewish storytelling tradition of the Dritzilla, in which thousands of old stories were carefully handed down by the women in Jewish households. It's a storytelling tradition that was nearly wiped out during the Holocaust. In fact, Shauna Lee may be the last Drutzilla alive. This story, just one of those thousands of stories, is called The Vizier Who Married the Gibbon. It's another story about a deceiver who gets deceived with results that we think you'll get a kick out of. Here's Shauna Lee. Thank you. So the story I'm going to tell you now is called The Vizier and the Gibbon. Now, first of all, because storytelling happens mainly in your mind, doesn't it? It's the pictures that you're putting. I need to make sure you know. Do you know what a vizier is? Do you know what a vizier is? It's kind of like an advisor to the king. So kind of an elderly wise man who advises the king on what to do, you know. Do you know what a gibbon looks like? Now, if you are a naturalist, forgive me. I think it's part of the ape family, but they are uncanny. They, they look almost human, you know, with their, they have long legs and long arms, and they, sometimes they walk upright, and, and they, they make the most unreal noises, um, and, and they have a, a temperament, or they're feisty. They have chutzpah, as we would say. <laughs> so this story is the vizier who married a gibbon. Yes, I see eyebrows going up. Don't worry, it's just a story. It's not something that happens in Europe. There was once a vizier whose job it was to advise the king. And although he was not of noble birth, he was of good birth and he loved the king's daughter. And he knew that the king would never let him marry the daughter the princess, but his heart longed for her. And so, whether this is good or bad, I I am not going to judge. He hatched a plan, a devious plan, not a good plan. (laughs) First of all, he went to the royal astrologer, the seer, and he crossed his palm 
with gelt, with gold. And he said, will you draw up an astrological chart for the king that says if he chooses his son-in-law, there'll be disaster. And the astrologer, who didn't earn a lot of money, said, yes, all right then. So he did. So the first thing the vizier does is he goes to the king and says, Your Majesty, I think you need to look at this. And he lays the plans out and he says, Look, if you marry your daughter off to someone that you choose, any offspring, any children of that marriage will rise up and kill you and take your throne. He was riffing now. He's got the bit between his teeth. <laughs> he was making things up. And the poor king, who was a bit gullible, a bit foolish, don't really know how he got to be king. Well, not go down that road at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, uh, well, what should I do? Now, you have to remember, parents were a lot harsher then. And the vizier had already thought this out. He had walked a river and he had seen that there was one little inlet where the, the river came, of, came round and eddied and whirled. And he'd got a plan. He'd mapped that part of the river. He'd hired a place up in the mountains and he'd gone to his neighbours and said, I am going to marry a young wife and she's a bit willful. Now you have to, this is an old story. He said, so if you hear the odd slap and the odd scream, it's just me disciplining her, don't come in. I know, <laughs> but you'll be thrilled at the end of this story. <laughs> Don't come in. And so with this in his mind and all this plotting and planning, he goes to the king and the king says, well, what should I do? I have a plan, your majesty. What we must do is invite your daughter to a feast and because we're not savages, we will drug her wine, put her in a, a, a casket, we'll line it nicely with silks because she is a princess and then we'll nail the lid down and throw her in the river. And the king says... What, what, what will happen then? And he said, well, it will go out to sea, it will get found by a boat, it will be taken to a foreign land and, and there she will marry and it won't be a husband of your choosing and everything will be fine. And the king, because he is a bit foolish, went, all right. <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. Because parenting back in those days, lot to be desired. <laughs> but you see... The princess's serving maid overheard everything. She ran to the princess and she said, this is what he's planning to do. Do you trust me, your majesty? And she said, you're like a sister to me. And she said, well, I know what he's planning. That box will end up in that little eddy and he'll fish it out and he'll take you away. But my brother and I have fished that river all of our lives. We know we know that there's one further upstream. We'll rescue you. You just have to go along with the plan. Drink the wine, fall asleep, leave everything else to us. And that's what she did. She went and she drank the wine and she fell asleep and the vizier thought, oh, my love. Put her in the box, they nailed it down. Bit of tar so, you know, it was watertight because they were caring like that. And then threw it into the river. Well, of course, the vizier goes straight to town, leaps upon the back of a cart that he's hired with two henchmen, and off he goes to retrieve the woman of his dreams. But you see, the first thing that happens is that box goes into the first little eddy, the first little inlet, and there is her, her maid and her brother, and they pull it out, and they open it up, and the maid's brother lifts out this woman and what happens between them is more stories than I can tell you. <laughs> but he lays her onto the cart and then they put inside a sleeping gibbon. <laughs> Nail it back down and put it back in the river. Well, the vizier arrives, he sees his box, he gets his henchmen to put it on the cart and, and they arrive at his home in the mountains and he pays the men off they, and, the, and the box beginning to rattle. He thinks, oh, she's woken up. Oh, she seems a bit angry. And they put the box in and off they go. Now the box is beginning to shake and rattle. And so he opens the box and I don't know if you've ever encountered an irate gibbon before. <laughs> it's an interesting phenomena. Well, this gibber leaps out and he grabs hold of the vizier and, the, and he's punching him and smacking him and the vizier's crying out and all the neighbours are going, oh, she really is willful. Well, not interfere. <laughs> well, not interfere. And he's getting slapped around. But you see, 
Weird, though, is he really did love the princess. And so instead of going, oh, my goodness, somebody's put a gibbon in a box. (laughs) Because love can kind of blind you a bit. He goes, my love, who has bewitched you so? Who has done this terrible thing to you? I will lift this curse if it takes a lifetime. (laughs) Have a banana. (laughs) Have this bowl of fruit. Well, the gibbon, placified by the offerings of fruit and vegetables and and, and has a hair combed, he massages his little paws and his feet and (laughs) drapes it in finery and the gibbon's lying there and he says, I will give up my job and I will devote my life to you, my love. Gets a priest to marry them a rather perplexed priest, but he says, no, it's a woman under an enchantment. And so the vizier gives up his job (laughs) and spends the rest of his life married to a gibbon that he cherishes beyond measure and a gibbon that has never known such luxury. (laughs) Unfortunately, people do talk. And so the story of the vizier who married a gibbon went out into the world and now you know it too. Thank you very much. An old story called The Vizier Who Married the Gibbon, told by Shauna Lee. Have you ever played a trick to find that the joke's really on you? Have you ever set out to make mischief for someone else and found that there were some consequences for you that you hadn't anticipated? I bet there are some stories there. Thanks to Donald Davis and Shauna Lee, you've listened to their stories. Now it's your turn to share some of your own. The Apple Seed is produced by Wendy Folsom, Sam Payne, and Brian Tanner. Our audio engineers are Ashton Parkinson and Carly Wilson. The rest of the Apple Seed team is Kelly Wehrmeister, Trent Horton, Evadane Hendricks, Miriam Arce, and Tristan Schetzel. A special thanks to the subscribers of our podcast who rate us or leave reviews. You help people find the show. We also love to receive emails at the Apple Seed at BYU.edu. Your thoughts and comments help us to shape the future of the Apple Seed. We're pleased and proud to be among the many podcasts produced by the BYU Radio family. And you can find episodes of the Apple Seed wherever podcasts are found on the BYU Radio app or at byuradio.org slash appleseed. I'm Sam Payne, and the whole team can't wait to be with you again on the Apple Seed. Mm-hmm.